In 1945, the world's first deployed atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima in Japan, killing almost 80,000 people instantly. That was on August 6th. Three days later, another bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki, killing almost 40,000 people instantly. How did these two bombs get to be so powerful? They used a mechanism called fission. In order to arrive at the actual most powerful explosive weapon, we need to know how did these two bombs exactly work. Now, I'm going to assume that you have some basic knowledge about the atom and what it is made of, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, as you know, the atomic number of an atom determines how many protons that you have, and that determines what element that you get. The atomic mass number is the number of protons and neutrons that an atom has, and that determines what isotope that you get. Let me give you, let me give you an example. Let's take the simplest element in the universe hydrogen. Now hydrogen has different isotopes. The simplest isotope is called protium. The nucleus of this isotope has only one proton. So its atomic number is one and its mass number is also one. Then you also have something called deuterium. Deuterium has an atomic number of one. It's still hydrogen. There's only one proton, but it has an atomic mass number of two because there's a neutron and a proton in the nucleus. There's also an isotope of hydrogen called tritium. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons. Atomic number still one, it's still hydrogen. Atomic mass number is three, you have one proton and two neutrons. Now what is different about tritium is that it is radioactive unlike protium and deuterium. So why is this relevant to us? Why do we need to know about things like this? Well, the radioactive part is very important in determining what is the most powerful weapon. So, with that said, let's delve a bit deeper into the subject. Now, what does this mean for tritium being radioactive? It means that after a while, it is likely to change into something else. Now, the period of time that is used to measure how long a quantity of an element is going to decay into something else is called half-life. I'm not talking about the video game here. Let me give you an example of what is going on here. Let's take one kilogram of tritium. Let's imagine that we have one kilogram of tritium. Now, the half-life of tritium is 12.32 years. This means that if you wait 12.32 years, half of this one kilogram of tritium is likely to decay into something else, change into something else. If you wait another 12.32 years, half of the remaining tritium will decay into something else. And if you wait another 12.32 years, half of that is likely to decay into something else, and so on and so forth. The process keeps on going. Now, as mentioned, tritium, when it comes to its nucleus, has two neutrons and one proton. What is happening is that one of the neutrons becomes a proton by emitting an electron. This type of radioactive process is called beta minus decay. There is another type of beta decay called beta plus decay, which is when one of the protons becomes a neutron by emitting an anti electron. So, so far we have two radioactive processes. There's another one called alpha decay. Now, alpha decay basically means that the nucleus of an atom emits, it gets rid of two protons and two neutrons. It's called an alpha particle. There's another type of decay called gamma decay. In, in a gamma decay, the nucleus of an atom doesn't really change in terms of the number of protons and the number of protons, but what happens is that you could say it releases excess energy. Now there is one radioactive process called fission, which is basically splitting an atom's nucleus in two, releasing massive amounts of energy in the process. If you were paying attention to me while I was talking in the beginning of the video, you probably have heard me say that the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs are fission 
bombs. And they basically use this radioactive decay process to generate the massive amount of energy needed to cause a massive amount of destruction. So what exactly is happening in those bombs? Well, in order to make a fission bomb, an, at an atomic bomb, you need fissionable fuel. A common fissionable fuel is uranium-235, an isotope of well, uranium, which is one of the few fuels in the world that could go through something called induced fission, which is basically forcing it to split, forcing the uranium-235 to split into two atomic nuclei. Do you see what is going on here? So how do these bombs actually use this to generate the energy needed to boom? So if you wanted to make a fission bomb, all you would have to do is take a bunch of uranium-235, you know, bombard it with neutrons. You don't have to do it for that long, just for a short period until a chain reaction starts, and just wait until everything kablam. Okay, so how does this happen exactly? Well, uranium-235, when you bombard it with neutrons, it is more than happy to absorb those neutrons. And when an atom of uranium-235 does that, it's... It, is likely to split into two, releasing energy, and there is a probability that it would release three more neutrons, which could, again, hit other uranium-235 atoms. They would absorb it, they split, they release energy, they are likely to release more neutrons, they hit other uranium-235 atoms, they split, energy goes out, and then they release their own neutrons, and so on and so forth. The process snowballs until blam, and you get an atomic bomb, a fission bomb. That's basically how they work. However, the fission bomb is not the most powerful bomb. There is something even more powerful than that. The most powerful fission bomb ever detonated by the United States, tested by the United States, is called IV King. And it had an explosive yield of 500 kilotons worth of TNT. That's 500,000 tons worth of TNT. That's a lot. That is really a lot. That's 31 times more powerful than Little Boy, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. That's 24 times more powerful than Fat Man, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. However, once you take a look at something called the hydrogen bomb, or you know, the fusion bomb, things can become much more powerful than that. Now, as I've said, a fission bomb works by splitting an atom's nucleus in two. However, a hydrogen bomb, a fusion bomb, part of it, not all of it, works by fusing the nucleus of atoms together. Okay, now, as I've said, this is only one part of the hydrogen bomb, the fusion bomb. In order to explain it very simply, uh, how a hydrogen bomb works, it's like a nuke within a nuke within a nuke, within a nuke. It's like Inception, but with nukes, pretty much. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about how it really works. If you'd like to find more about that, there's a link in the description. But a normal hydrogen bomb, a fusion bomb, works by first an internal implosion through fission. Okay, and then this implosion releases x-rays and energy, and then that induces another fission reaction, and then that fission reaction creates enough pressure and heat to make hydrogen atoms fuse, that's why it's called the hydrogen uh, bomb, and then that fusion process induces another fission process, so you end up with something like fission, fission, fusion, fission, and at the end of it, you get a monumental explosion of epic proportions. That's basically how a hydrogen bomb, a fusion bomb, works. The most powerful hydrogen bomb, fusion bomb, ever detonated was called the Tsar Bomba. The Tsar Bomba exploded with an explosive yield of 50 megatons. That's 50,000 kilotons worth of TNT behind this 
thing. That's 3,125 times more powerful than Little Boy, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, and 2,380 times more powerful than Fat Man, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. That's 100 times more powerful than the most powerful fission bomb tested by the United States, IV King. But it's difficult to put all of this in perspective through numbers. So here is a website, very cool website. All you have to do is select a location and just nuke it to see what exactly would happen. Not actually nuke it, just see what would a nuke exactly do to that location. So here is what little boy would do to my country. Here is what fat man would do to my country. Here is what Ivy King would do to my country. And here is what the Tsar Bomba would do to my country. So that looks really horrible and awful. So I hope that it never happens. I really do. Now you might be thinking, well, what about that antimatter bomb thing? I mean, if you take an antimatter atom and a matter atom, and then you collide them with one another, they are going to release the contained energies within them at 100% efficiency. It is the embodiment of E equals MC squared. Wouldn't that make a more powerful weapon than the hydrogen bomb? Well, uh, there are a few problems with that, actually. First of all, that 100% thing, complicated, technical, explanation, description. Okay, I'm not going to get into that, but that's not the problem with making an antimatter bomb. The problem with making an antimatter bomb is practicality. You could dig anywhere on Earth and you will not find a single nanogram of antimatter. Her. And antimatter is extremely inefficient to produce. And the only way to do it is through particle accelerators. The thing is, you will only get one tenth of a billion of the amount of energy invested in antimatter. That is according to CERN. So if you wanted to make an antimatter bomb with the same explosive yield as Fat Man, 21 kilotons, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, you would need to put about this much Tsar Bomba's worth of energy into making it. Second of all, containing antimatter is insane. As you mentioned, as soon as matter comes in contact with matter, they pretty much annihilate each other. And now, well, you don't really have any antimatter anymore. The highest containment time that CERN managed to get out of antimatter is 17 minutes. That's it. It's not that much. The only realistic way for you to make an antimatter bomb is to find a chunk of antimatter lying about in space somewhere, finding a way to contain it. Good luck with that, by the way. And then maybe you could use it as fuel in an antimatter bomb. Otherwise, it looks like, when it comes to our choice as humans, for weapons of mass destruction, explosive weapons of mass destruction, the hydrogen bomb is going to be here for a really long time. Actually, it is possible that we will never be able to create something more powerful than fusion-based weapons. I mean, think about this. There is something out there right now that is outputting more energy than anything else that I have mentioned so far. And it is using nuclear fusion to do this. What is it? It is the sun. The sun is basically one gigantic hydrogen bomb that keeps going off again and again and again and again. Now, granted, it's, most, it's like just fusion, not really fission, uh, doing it. But you could see how big a fusion-based weapon can get to. The, the sun is basically one ginormous uh, uh, fusion-based weapon. So if we ever get a visit by aliens and they wanted to wipe us off the planet, they would probably do it through fusion-based bombs as well. So if we try to nuke them, they'll just nuke us back. And that's not really something that we would want.